Welcome to the Welcome to Television Book Club, the very first episode of the Welcome to Television Book Club. I'm Tina. Yeah, right? Yeah. I'm Tina. And I'm Max. And we're going to be talking about the Once Upon a Time tie-in novel, Henry and Violet. So this is kind of like a post-mortem on our original podcast, Welcome to Storybrooke. And that's why I wanted to start with this one. I'm hoping to make this a monthly podcast, and I'm not quite sure what the format is going to be, but this week... I will just be telling Max what happens in this truly terrible tie-in novel, since uh, you have all of the experience of going through Once Upon a Time. That is an accurate statement. We have watched and discussed every episode of Once Upon a Time ad nauseum. Although, as we mentioned on one of our other podcasts, despite having seen all of Once Upon a Time, I feel like I would have a really hard time pinpointing what happened in specific episodes and not just season-long arcs. I think people don't understand um, the extent to which podcasting can sometimes fry your brain. And it's like, we took all the Once Upon a Time knowledge and put it out there in the world, and then... I mean, I still feel like I have very solid memories of what happened, granted, mostly in the later seasons of Once Upon a Time. Well, good news, because this book takes place between seasons six and seven. So between the end of the show in the reboot season yes that's correct <laughs> Oof. is the i mean i know it's not because you know there's really been no continuation from that point on but is the reboot season even canon i mean come on come on like they threw so much stuff out the window oh my god it... which i know is like par for the course for once upon a time but the final season doesn't even seem to be canon with itself but speaking of not canon i I get the impression that the writer of this book, Michelle Zink, who, by the way, this book is so bad that I had to go look up her as an author to make sure that she, like, has her own stuff and is doing okay, because otherwise I would feel bad about what I'm going to say about this book. But I feel like she had someone, like, drunkenly tell her a quick synopsis of half of the characters in Once Upon a Time, and that's the... Entirety of the knowledge she had when she went into the book. Okay, so I read my fair share of tie-in novels as a young person. Mm Mm-hmm. So they vary a lot. I read a bunch of the Charmed ones back in the day, and there were some where, you know, they were very involved with the continuity of the show. And there were other ones where it was like the sisters had weird energy powers because I'm willing to bet someone just kind of skimmed whatever the 2002 version of a Wikipedia page was. Right? So I just guested on Jay and Miles Explain the Mm X-Men because they were talking about the X-Men Star Trek crossover novels, and I am a huge aficionado of the Star Trek novel tie-ins. It's one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast. Mm -hmm. And when the Star Trek books were being published, they're still being published, with the Star Trek books, there is a person who who just liaises with Paramount and gets approval for every single item that happens in the book to make sure that it's accurate to what happens in the show. Mm. Like, I read a story about someone getting hassled because his star date was off and they made him change his star date. They told him he couldn't have Chekhov in the novel because of the star date he had chosen. He was like, what if I just change the star date instead of writing a whole new part without Chekhov? And they were like, oh, I guess that works too. But this, this, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Once Upon a Time does not have that. So there's a thing with, I'm sure his name will come up as you do this series. I'm here for the first episode. This will not always be the case. So how many of the Buffy tie-in novels did you read? Okay, so I've only read one, Mm -hmm. and only since I started wanting to do this podcast. I have purchased several for future episodes, but I've only read one. And it was actually pretty accurate, the one I read. Okay, Christopher Golden did a lot of those. I get the feeling from the frequency with which his name pops up and the sort of thing that he's kind of the go-to guy for TV tie and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. And there there was an interesting thing with, I'm not sure they were his Buffy books exactly, but a lot of the Buffy books did have their own internal continuity. Right, there's there's like another, there's a History of the Slayers book, right? I 
believe so, although that's not what I'm familiar with. What, what I am familiar with is that one of the books that took place in vague season five times mm-hmm. is about Buffy fighting a former vampire slayer who got turned. And I'm like, A, how did they never do that in the show? Seriously. Right? And uh, B, it, and the, the main thing is that it gets mentioned in other tie-in novels written by the same person. So they kind of have their own little bubble of continuity. Like stuff that happens in that book gets brought up later. I'm like, that's an interesting thing to kind of add your own sort of separate layer of continuity while still staying within the continuity of the show as best you can. Because obviously it is kind of its own separate continuity, no matter what Joss Whedon or whoever says. Because, well, yeah. you know, if Buffy had fought a former Vampire Slayer vampire, it would have come up in the show. But... I feel like you do get kind of that wiggle room, Mm -hmm. but this does not sound like that case at all. This sounds like just... Oh, no, no, this is not... This is the Charmed Ones having weird energy powers. Oh, yes, just you wait. Okay, so to quickly kind of give you an overview of the plot... (laughs) The plot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to sum up the plot as two teenagers fail to buy a book. That's the plot of this novel. So Henry and Violet, right? Yes. Henry and Violet are on an overnight field trip to New York. And the bulk of the novel is in their heads as the two of them and the chapters go back and forth between whose head we're in. Mm-hmm. And the bulk of the novel is them realizing that they're not going to stay together when they go off to college. They're going to break up. So it's basically just a novel about two teenagers realizing that they're going to break up. Was this written before the reboot season? Because does Henry mention the fact, I'm assuming not because of the woman who wrote this apparently not having a good grasp on Once Upon a Time continuity, but uh, does Henry mention at all that he's planning on, instead of going to college, riding a motorcycle off into an alternate dimension? He does not, but he does say he's not sure he wants to go to college. So hmm. I think this was written before the seventh season, and he doesn't mention his gap year in the wish verse. So... Or wherever he was. Or wherever he was. It's not super clear. So, the thing is, Once Upon a Time is kind of perfect for this sort of tie-in novel thing. Because of how much stuff the show itself just completely fucking dropped, speaking of season seven. Well, one of the things that we talked about a lot was how the world must feel from Henry's point of view. So, A tie-in novel from Henry's point of view seems like it will be amazing. He was the only person in town who aged for the first 10 years of his life. Okay, so let's jump into it. Okay. It starts off with Violet getting all excited about going on the field trip with Henry, and she exposits that while they're in New York, they're going to sneak away from the chaperones and go to this antique shop that she found online that has a copy of her father's journal. Not a copy. It has one of her father's journals. Now, remember, her father... Is a Connecticut Yankee from King Arthur's Court. Right. So, and he's all despondent, apparently, now that he's back in Storybrooke. So she wants to make him feel good. So she's going to go get this engineering notebook that he kept that has been put up for sale at this antique shop. What an awful premise for a book. I'm sorry. I mean, I know I'm... a. Actually, I'm assuming not because of what you've told me about the book. The very little you've told me about the book. But, like, they didn't want to focus on anything, like, interesting from the show. What's Mulan up to? That was a really cool thing that got dropped multiple times. I I mean, I think you might have thought I was exaggerating when I talked about how bad this was. Okay, so... Fine, I can see this as being a young adult novel-esque thing. A girl wants to cheer up her depressed father, so she tries to... Why Why? Why? Why do they have his journals? Wasn't he in the Land of Untold Stories? For... It's from before he went to the Land of Untold Stories. It's from before he was... Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. He was in Camelot. He was in Camelot. So how does this place in New York have his journal if he was in Camelot? No, no, he got sucked into Camelot from Connecticut. Okay, so this is from when he was a kid before anything ever happened to him. He was sucked into Camelot as he was an adult. And oh, he, right. I'm sorry. I was you, thinking you're thinking of, of a kid, kid at King, King Arthur's, Arthur's court. court. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. He was he was an adult. So So it's just a bunch of boring crap from before anything happened to him. Yeah. Well, but it's not it's not a journal like, Dear Diary, today I woke up and had eggs for breakfast. It's a journal like 
one of uh, Da Vinci's journals with, like, his drawings of helicopters and shit. Okay, and this isn't an antique shop. This is a thing an antique shop would keep. Yes, apparently. Okay. So. We have, we've barely started. I know, I know. I'm sorry. So after Violet tells, you know, us what that she's going to do on the trip, we see Henry's point of view and he kind of introduces us and he introduces who he is. And here is what he says about his living situation. So they're... I, I guess they did have that house separately that Emma stole when she was the dark one and they just never gave it back afterwards. That is correct. Having two moms was cool most of the time. He had two bedrooms and two houses and moved easily back and forth between them. Killian was there when Henry was on mom overload and his grandparents' house was always available as an escape. All in all, his life was pretty awesome. Oh, God. Was this written by a fourth grader? I'm sorry. Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? I mean, I, I get it. She's trying to sound like a teenage boy, but so God, can you imagine? Oh, I'm having too much of the best characters in the show, Emma and Regina. I guess I have to hang out with Killian. Hope he doesn't attempt to send me to hell. Oh, you know what? I didn't even mention the worst sin that this book commits of all of its sins. No, Regina! Wait, seriously? Yeah, there's no Regina in this How book. How do you have a Once Upon a Time book with no Regina? That's ridiculous like i mean i know out of all of the characters in once upon a time she probably has the most backstory she probably has the most ridiculously over gone into backstory but mm -hmm. really yeah no regina really yeah please don't tell me we have killian though we do have killian but not God. not a lot honestly it's mostly henry and violet and barely anyone else so they get to the bus, and Violet is so happy to see Henry. You know why she's so happy to see Henry? Why? Because she knows hardly anyone, because all the kids in Storybrooke grew up together. Okay. 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 So, we basically never see Henry have a peer group throughout all of Once Upon a Time, because obviously everyone else was stuck in this non-aging time bubble for the first 10, 10 years of his life. Yeah. Like, so Henry couldn't really emotionally connect anyone because he was literally the only person aging. So if he made friends in first grade, they would still be in first grade when he was in second grade. And we kind of see him not talk to anyone ever because, you know. Yeah. Obviously that would take some adjustment and he never really had time with, you know, being kidnapped and becoming God two separate times. But... Which, you think he would have hung out with uh, Hansel and Gretel. Remember them? <laughs> I remember them. Yeah, from that one episode in season one. It was the closest Henry ever got to getting a peer group his own age. Yeah. Outside of, I guess, kind of dating Violet before the show <laughs> dropped her like a hot potato. This book weirdly makes up a bunch of kids who are supposedly Henry and Violet's classmates, even though the TV show gave us none of that. So we're actually going to talk a lot about those kids and all of the things they say that directly contradict what we know about the world of Once Upon a Time. Okay, are they kids, are they other kids from fairy tales? No. No. In fact, I, I wasn't going to bring this up till later. Yeah. But the dedication in this book, the dedication is dedicated to everyone who's ready for a new fairy tale. And I get the strong impression that the writer didn't know that Once Upon a Time was like fairy tales remixed. And a couple of times I'm going to call out points where it seems like she was trying to create this idea of New York as like a mystical fairy tale place with fairy tale esque creatures who don't actually resemble fairy tales that we know. It's like, I feel like she's that guy from the beginning of Pretty Woman just shouting about how, well, in Pretty Woman it's Hollywood, but just shouting about how Hollywood is a place where fairy tales happen. Okay. I. Why was this person chosen to write this book? I haven't the faintest idea. Like,. I'm sorry, aren't there like 7 million Disney adults out there cranking out fan fiction that would just slide right into this book? Right? <laughs> like. This is, this is not an unfanficked property. Like, is this a somebody's cousin situation? It's beyond me that this person got this job writing this. Ugh, I know. Also, does Henry run into, I know 
the answer is going to be no because it would require just even a baseline of continuity but does henry run into any of his new york friends from his second life in new york when regina you know recast the curse to give uh, him and Emma a normal life at the end of season three, I want to say. He does not. And also he doesn't know how to work the subway system. So none of that must have happened. Okay, the mid, I'm sorry, the midpoint of season three. Okay, so he just doesn't have any memories of his life living in New York where he was raised in, you know, is a lifetime of memories of being raised in New York and yeah. was actually physically there for a year. Yeah, but no, no. Okay, then. So Emma and Killian are going to be chaperoning on the trip. They're going to be chaperones. Like, I know ACAP, but aren't they Storybrooke's only cops except, oh, God, David. Yeah, well, and Mary Margaret's chaperoning, so David has nothing to do. David's not mentioned in this book, like, at all. I, I think Henry might at one point say, like, his grandparents, yeah, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, you, you mentioned in the, in the quote that he liked to chill out at his grandparents, you know, his grandparents who have that baby and are tiny, tiny loft, but... <laughs> I, okay, whatever. I'm sure, uh, I, I guess it would be less paperwork for Emma when she comes back and David's killed everyone, even vaguely crime adjacent. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up paperwork. Because at the bus, Mary Margaret is kind of organizing the kids into groups and assigning them to chaperones. And she says, someone miscounted. We have eight more kids than we expected. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to object to that. No, that's, that's accurate. I'm not going to object to that because are the kids from the land of untold stories there? Are they not there? There was a rigid airship that dropped a bunch of people off, but then the rest of that season kind of just ignored all of the people from the land of untold stories. So, you know what? I think it's completely fair that Mary Margaret would have no idea how many kids she's supposed to have. But it's not all the kids who go to the school. It's presumably all of the kids who turned in their field trip permission slips. Oh, yeah. Well, we also know we also know Mary Margaret is straight up terrible at right. <laughs> anything even leadership adjacent. Oh, my God. So many times in this book, Violet and Henry are both thinking about what they're going to do when they go off to college. And I'm just sitting here thinking, all you know how to do is build birdhouses. What college are you getting into? No, remember that one time where Mary Margaret decided to teach the kids about physics by shooting arrows? Oh, yeah. You know, in that thing where she's like, I need to be less Mary Margaret and more Snow White. And then she went the other direction with it. And then they were like, you know what? Jennifer Goodwin does not want to be in this show. We don't have to give Mary Margaret plots. Like, when she was all hep about, you know, building the school and, like, I was a teacher once. And then she was like, but I'm also Snow White. And then Jasmine was like, I kind of have a plot. And Mary Margaret's like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm done teaching. Screw you, kids! Up yours, children! I'm sorry, go on. They're looking for a book or something? Oh, no, it's chapter four and they're only just getting on the bus to get to New York. What happened for the first three chapters? all the stuff i told you about that does not seem like three chapters worth of stuff <laughs> and yet okay <laughs> okay so while he's on the bus he goes to like talk to emma about how things aren't going well with violet because you know they're gonna grow up and go to college and emma tries to give him some advice and she says i know you can't make decisions about your future based on violet and she can't make decisions for herself based on what you do you each have to do what's best for yourselves and trust things will work out the way they're meant to I know that sounds like a lame grown-up thing to say, but it's true. And the thing is, that's not bad advice, but Emma, <laughs> your boyfriend knocked you up and then abandoned you and left you to take the fall for stealing some watches and also was secretly Rumpelstiltskin's son. So I don't know how this just go with it and everything will work out is coming from. Okay, I want to kind of, I'm not going to say one up. Actually, I am going to say one up one up that but it does kind of fall in line with that remember that one time where she brought her entire family to hell to try to rescue her dead boyfriend yes like i feel like emma might not be the person to take advice from definitely not love advice mm. also that really sounds more mary margarety to me oh my god that's definitely a mary margaret thing to say although i maybe she would just tell them to stay together because love or whatever yeah, right? You'll always find each other. Barf. Yeah. Although, I mean, let's be honest. They're high schoolers dating each other. That's probably not how that's going to shake out. So Violet on the bus is sitting with her friends, and everybody is so excited that even Lizette seemed enraptured by the scene, 
her phone nowhere in sight. Because millennials and their phones. And millennials is accurate because that's the time period this book takes place in. Yes. Uh, so was this written by the uh, person who did, what was that movie again? Swiped? Yeah, it, it was, was this written by the woman who did Swiped? Because uh, that's, some, that's some real... Uh, some real social commentary there also like uh, i guess theoretically it could be a storybook kid who would therefore have grown up with modern ish technology although regina did seem like she was kind of keeping the town in this weird liminal space uh, yeah it was like it was like vaguely the 50s small town kind of thing yeah and there were like some updated things but like i, I think it gets pointed out at one point that the uh the stair the sheriff station's video recording stuff is all Betamax, so I feel like it was all kind of spread out how much tech the town had. I'm not saying it's unreasonable that someone would have a cell phone. But... I mean, it would make sense that she had a cell phone, but the whole, like, idea of, oh, these kids and their phones these days, I wrote in the notes, is she even a fairy tale character? Like, what is even happening? Mm. All right, so remember how I told you it seemed like... The author's trying to, like, make New York a fairy tale place. Yeah. Okay, so they show up in New York, and this is the passage. Violet was watching for Sadie and Lizette when she heard a voice carrying over the sidewalk. She turned to see a man in a hat and tweed suit standing with his back to the line of buses as he gestured dramatically toward the water beyond the park. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics. Or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it, then. To learn. Okay. I suppose there's probably a lot of homeless ex-NYU students just milling around the bus station. Yeah. Like, I... Okay, I I don't know what to do with that. There is magic in New York. Not great magic, but isn't that where the dragon lived? Or... Yeah, the dragon lived in New York. And and Ursula escaped to New York. Yeah, although... She didn't have magic, but yeah. Yeah, flying monkey in New York. There was a flying monkey in New York. Although, again, didn't have magic. So speaking of New York... Yeah. I asked you to think about this before we started recording. Mm-hmm. If you were taking a bunch of juniors... On an overnight field trip to New York, what places would you take them to? Okay, so obviously the the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, probably the Guggenheim. Uh, all of my stuff is art based, so the Folk Art Museum. That might be a bit much. I'd probably just take them to like two museums and then something super touristy, like the Statue of Liberty. Okay, let me tell you where these kids are going according to their uh, their itinerary that we're told. All right. So first, Ellis Island. Yeah, okay, yeah. Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. Really? Then they're going to go bowling at the Chelsea Pier. Which, by the way, why bowling at the Chelsea Pier? You could do Coney Island. You know it's free to send them anywhere, right? Because it's, it's not a, real. It's a... B <laughs> then they're going to do a dinner cruise on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And then the next day they are going to the Met. Okay. So... Something I did a while ago. I don't know if these books are still a thing or if the internet killed them, but there used to be like a thousand things to do in X. Oh, sure. Yeah, I remember those books. And I remember picking one up because it was, um, you know, 1001 Things to Do in Connecticut. And that was where I was living at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, let's see. And you really get the impression that whoever wrote those books had never actually been to Connecticut. Mm. And I'm assuming other places because it was stuff like... Go to the Mystic Aquarium. And it's like, it's just an aquarium. If you've been to any other aquarium, it's it's an aquarium. Like, yeah, it's not, or I think it was, maybe there were like a thousand and one things you have to do in Connecticut before you die or something. That's another series, yeah. But it was all this like basic ass Googling what to do in Connecticut stuff. And I feel like this person made, might have just, you know, first page of Google results, things to do in New York. Because you can go bowling literally anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't understand. You know what I would do with this? 
juniors, I, I forgot to mention it in my thing, I'd take them to a Broadway play. Not like a good one, or, you know, not like necessarily a bad one, but something, you know, stompish. Where Yeah. Of course, no, no offense to fans of stomp. I mean, they could probably even get a group rate for a matinee. Like, that, that, they should definitely be taking them to see a show. Yeah, like, when I was in high school and we did trips to New York, we'd, you know, we'd get really bad seats to a Broadway play, and we'd do the Met. That was, like, every school trip I took to New York. Oh, I'm so jealous of you growing up in the Northeast and getting to do school trips to New York. Yeah, the, America does not have much of a railway system, but uh, the one that we did have went from my hometown to New York, which I did not take advantage of at all as a child and or teenager. Maybe I was luckier then in that I have a mother who is really into Broadway. So I got to go up to New York a lot as a teenager with my mom to see plays. Yeah, I mean, I didn't take advantage of it on my own, but I did go to New York a bunch with my parents. Like, yeah. my my parents are also Broadway people. All right, so I know we're hammering this, or, or I'm hammering it, but... They get split up into their groups, and Violet's looking at the group she's with. And it was a good group. Jack and Matthew were in her pre-calculus class, and she'd gotten to know Ruth the year before in gym. Melody was new to the school, but Violet always saw her reading in the halls and at lunch. She had a feeling they could be friends. Okay, okay. Technically? Technically, if this is after season six, I suppose... Suppose someone could have moved to Storybrooke. How? I'm fairly certain the town was still mystically cut off from the rest of the world. At oh, that I was point. assuming after the end of the, you know, the fake end of the show, it was open to the world like it stopped being hidden. I, I don't know. I, I don't think that was ever really established it like, wasn't i just like it could have been i mean theoretically she could have been i guess homeschooled or something like maybe there was a mrs haversham type and then she died so this girl got to go once you know time wasn't frozen anymore whatever old lady was taking care of her only had a few more years before she kicked the bucket and then she's like oh i can go to real school i guess. i don't know i that that Storybrooke having a new student is really, it really betrays a lack of knowledge of what happens in the show. Right? Okay, one more, and then I'm going to move on to the plot, as it were. Hmm. You ever been here before, Jack asked, next to him? Henry had known Jack since third grade. They'd never been close friends, but Henry liked him well enough. Sure, Henry said, how about you? Once, Jack said, readjusting the backpack on his lanky frame, but it was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> that was like... Okay, okay, so for those of you who are not super familiar with Once Upon a Time or haven't watched it in several years, you may have forgotten that the entire premise of the show is that the evil queen from Snow White created a town in the real world and then trapped all of the fairy tale characters there. The key word in that sentence being TRAPPED. You know, because for the first, I don't know, what was it, 29 years of the curse, no one could leave. And also, again, Henry was the only one who aged, so he he couldn't have grown up with this kid. That's literally not how it worked. I just... that This is something like if you have seen an episode from season one, if you have read a summary... Of season one, you should know that nobody other than Henry should have been able to, except for the past couple of years, have gone to New York at any point. Right? I was going to say, it feels like she just read the first paragraph of the Wikipedia entry about this, but it seems like she just read the first sentence. Ugh. So... Henry and Violet are planning to break away from their chaperones at this point and go to the uh, the bookstore. I keep calling it a bookstore. It's not a bookstore. It's an antique shop. Mm. But anyway, they're planning to break away. And uh, it doesn't work out. They kind of get herded into the group and they get herded onto the ferry to go to Ellis Island. And Henry's like, damn it. I guess I should have made a plan. And I'm like, Henry, that's your whole thing. Your whole thing is that you make plans. You're you're the author, if you forgot, which, to be fair, he kind of did in the last season. Violet, though, thinks to herself, 
gosh, why did I just assume everything would always work out for me? And I thought, you know what? Maybe she should marry Henry because she is already a charming. So I know it's not going to be a thing, but is there any reason Henry can't just ask Emma, you know, hey, we want to go to an antique store to buy something. You cool with that? Because I am 10,000%. Oh, oh from- don't get ahead of us. Okay. All right. But I'm, I'm glad you noted that. All right. This doesn't have anything to do with anything, which kind of is why I want to bring it up. Mm-hmm. Just this. Uh, okay. So this is them sailing past the Statue of Liberty. All right. She rose from the water like a peaceful warrior, the sun shining on her crown, her torch held high for all to see. Violet thought about everything she'd learned in U.S. history at school, seeing in her mind's eye all the people who must have been greeted by the statue when they arrived in America. She was surprised to feel her throat choke with emotion. She'd been so caught up worrying about the notebook that she'd forgotten to appreciate what was right in front of her. The boat's passengers had grown quiet, as if everyone was equally moved by the sight. For a moment there was nothing but the sound of the wind, the water under the boat, and the quiet clicking of cameras as everyone took pictures. Violet looked up at Henry. He smiled and reached over for her hand, the moment settling between them. She suddenly wasn't quite as sorry they'd been unable to sneak away at the ferry terminal. Whatever happened with her father's notebook, she was glad she'd been part of the magic on the boat when hundreds of people had been rendered silent by history brought to life. Okay, so this person's never been on a tour, then. (laughs) I just... I mean... Also, why is Violet all choked up? She's from Camelot. Yeah, like... It's only a model. It was literally only a model. Oh, yeah, that's true. It was all an illusion. (laughs) But why would she give a sh... I mean, I guess maybe because she's also a refugee, kind of. But, like, I don't know. Was this written, like... I know, it can't have been because timeline was, but it feels really like it might have been written directly after September 11th. When everything was, like, bonkers patriotic for no reason. I mean, maybe it was written then. That's not when it was published, but... I, I, well, I'd... I mean, Once Upon a Time wasn't a thing. No, but I was going to say, that section feels to me like she wrote it for something else and was like, oh, they're in New York, I'll drop it in here. I mean, I'm willing to bet probably a lot of this was transposed from something else she had written. Like, I don't know if whoever's listening to this really remembers, but... We, we watched a bunch of TV from around that time, and there's that weird thing where pro-America stuff kind of started leaking into things that normally wouldn't mention pro-America stuff. Well, like, um, the, in Friends, everyone wearing their, like, proud-to-be-an-American shirts or their NYPD or FDNY shirts. Yeah, the one I was thinking of was the season of Sabrina where everyone was suddenly decked out in American flags and all that jazz. Right, exactly. And, like, suddenly the conspiracy theorist wasn't saying anything, you know, bad about America anymore. And you're like, oh. Uh. Yeah. You're, at first you're like, what's going on? And then you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's around when this. Yeah, yeah. You look at the you look at the date that it came out and you're like, oh. Like, I, I mean, I was around during that. I remember it. But nowadays overt aggressive patriotism more skeeves me out than anything else Mm, yeah yeah like i get it it drew the nation together but like Uh, uh, let's let's not get into that (laughs) yeah that was the the one time when you know everyone was suddenly super cool with new york you should hear what you know that's true that's true so they couldn't get away before they got on the ferry, but they get to Ellis Island and they realize that they can just get on a different ferry leaving. So they ditch their group, including their chaperones, which, remember, includes Emma and Mary Margaret and Killian, but whatever, who gives a fuck about Killian. Mm. So they get on a different ferry off of Ellis Island. They go to the subway station and Henry's kind of confused about the map and Violet's like, oh, I don't know, Henry, what do you think? And he's like, no, I think I got it. I got it. Let's go. And he takes them... Okay, we get a whole chapter where they're riding the subway. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. To get from point A to point B, like... Oh! Oh! They get off the subway, and then it turns out that Henry took them to East 4th Street instead of West 4th Street. Okay, I can't judge because of that one time in Seattle where I ended up in... Yeah, but this is like three chapters of stuff! 
what is this, season seven? Uh, and then he gets really shitty with Violet. He's like, you said East, even though we know because we were reading that she did not say East, she said West. And he's like, well, if you thought that something might be wrong, why didn't you say anything? And he's just like so crappy to her. So chapter 13, they finally get to the store. And it's closed. Not just closed for the day, but it's shut down. It's out of business. And I do have to say, now he's like, why didn't you call the number before we left Storybook? And there I am kind of on Henry's side. Yeah. So she calls the number now on the website, which is important because she hears the voicemail and she hears the name of the proprietress of the shop, which is uh, Mildred Applebaum. Uh, Mildred Appleby. So that's not a fairy tale reference at all, is it? It's not. But it's important because, you know, I was talking to you about, you know, the fairy tale moments in New York. Mm hmm. And this happens. A sing songy voice erupted to his left, and he looked over to see a bedraggled elderly man sitting with his back against the brick building. He wore a tweed coat that was full of holes, his shoes highly shined, a black hat sat next to him on the pavement. Whitney comes to 4th Street to bring Mildred and Emmett a morning treat, he sang. Then it's on to Tiffany's shiny rings, the man on the sidewalk continued singing, until the next day when she brings more delicious things. And Violet's like, oh, hey, the woman who owns the shop is named Mildred. Uh, that's probably not just nonsense, he's saying. He probably knows her and knows what's up. So Henry, heart of the true believer that he is, is like, that's nonsense! That makes no sense, and there's no way that's true! I mean, that's probably true, but how does that help them at all? Well, remember, he says, then it's on to Tiffany's shiny rings, until the next day when she brings more delicious things. So, Violet's like, oh, Whitney's probably a girl who works at Tiffany's, who stops by here in the morning and brings him, like, pastries or whatever. And Henry says, what's Tiffany's? Never heard of it! Okay, okay, okay. 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 So, we know Henry's a movie buff. That's one of the things he vaguely bonded with Violet over, like, be getting to be the guy who introduces her to movies. Mm-hmm. And also, we know that he has, like, 12 years of memories of living in New York. Also, we know that he's a person who lives in the world. Right? Like... I'm sorry, that's not a... Is it supposed to be because he's a high school boy? Because... You know what fucking Tiffany's is? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Oh my god. Ah, I mean, it's not the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The internet exists, but like... Oh, it's not even the dumbest thing you're going to hear tonight. God, okay. Let's... But also, so the woman who runs the shop knows a girl who works at Tiffany's? That's what they're hoping. Why don't they just call the woman who runs? Oh, they they did call. They got voicemail. That, but that's how that's how Violet knew her name was was Mildred because she called the voicemail and the voicemail was like, "Hi, my short store shut down, but this is Mildred. If you want to buy something from me, leave a message." Then they should just leave a message. Well, she did, but they're only in New York, you know, today and tomorrow. If she doesn't get the notebook now, then she'll have to call from Storybrooke and have it shipped. This is the most non-conflict a story has ever had. I Okay, so they're going to just stalk this woman in hopes of forcing her to sell them a book that might cheer Violet's dad up. That is correct. That is what's happening right now. Okay, they know that like, they fought like giants and witches and stuff. I mean, they didn't fight giants. They well, they fought Hurley, but it turned out he was good. I mean, but like they fought fairy tale creatures. Why? Why is there not a plot in this book? Well, and also the whole thing with Once Upon a Time is that it had that same structure as Lost, where it went back and forth between the fairy tale story and the present. Yeah. Like, why isn't this book interspersed with? Things that Violet did in Camelot, which would be great because we never got a story from Violet's point of view. Yeah. We could have a story of her in Camelot. Hell, why didn't the book that uh, the woman have, why didn't it have how um, her dad created a portal to get to Camelot in the first place? Why, why isn't it a magic book? It could very easily be a magic book and then you might have a little bit of a plot. Right? Also, all of these characters... Uh, Mildred, who we're going to meet, and Whitney, 
who works at Tiffany's, who we're going to meet in a minute, and this other guy, Basil, who we're going to meet later. Like, none of them are actual fairy tale characters, but they could have been. They could have been fairy tale characters, and their plot intersecting with Henry's and Violet's could have tied back to the whole them breaking up thing, and it could have been a flashback. Like, the man who sold Jack the cow for beans. Like, come on. Right. Like, this is the easiest thing in the universe. Apparently not. Everyone grew up with fairy tales, even if you're not super familiar with the show. But like, you know what a fairy tale is, right? You were a child at one point, right? Come on! So, they do find Whitney. They go down to Tiffany's and they find Whitney. Whitney Day, which is another really kind of magical sounding name, I mm. feel. And she tells them that Mildred is her grandmother. And she will take them over to her place in an hour when she gets off work. So they decide to spend the hour window shopping on Fifth Avenue because Violet's a girl and that's what girls do. That is what girls do. And Henry's just pouty because... Boy. Boy. And then they walk past Mont Blanc and Violet's like, oh man, Henry, look at these awesome pens. Wouldn't it be great to work on the book with a pen like this? So, okay, first of all, I don't think the author understands what the book is. I, I don't think... The author being the person who wrote this Oh, book. right, of course. I didn't mean to confuse this. I don't think Michelle, the writer of this book, understands what the book is that Henry's writing. Also, he's like, I don't need a fancy pen to work on the book, which is true... I mean, he had that magic pen, but then it turned out like the magic was in him or something after he sent the pen to hell. Yeah. Because it was that thing where he, he broke the pen, but then he found it again in hell. But then it turned out, I think it turned out he didn't need it. Like, I don't he did, think he, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't need the pen. Like he didn't because he didn't bring it out of hell with him. But then he still had access to his author powers when he entered that author state, which uh, Isaac implied was going to kill him. But then that just straight up never came back. Mm -hmm. Because Once Upon a Time loves nothing more than dropping plots. Remember when the Tremaine sisters were like the most powerful magical people in uh, the universe until... You remember when season seven was about the Tremaine sisters? For about seven episodes. And then they all disappear forever. And the fact that... Uh, was it Anastasia? The fact that Anastasia, like, was the most magical person in the face of the planet turned out to be a red herring. And it was actually Alice, even though it made... Even though, then why did Anastasia have all that magic power if she wasn't the chosen one? Why did she have all these powers in the world without magic? And we're not here to relitigate season seven. We're, we're here to first time litigate this terrible, terrible tie-in novel. Yep. But the fact that that's not how the author powers work isn't even my point as much as it is that Violet's like trying to engage him in something because he's being crappy and he's like... That's how the book works, Violet. It's like, shut up, Henry. Wow. Whew, season one flashbacks. Getting season one flashbacks over here. Yeah, remember when Henry was, like, the worst? This this book remembers. Or, <laughs> That's... or, or coincidentally happens upon it. You know, infinite monkeys, forever, Shakespeare, etc. Exactly. Anyway, an hour later, Whitney comes and takes them to Mildred's apartment. And guess what? She doesn't have the book. She sold it three days ago. Okay, so it's a fetch quest. It, it, it's a fetch quest. She sold it to a private broker, and Violet convinces Mildred to give her the name of the broker that she sold it to, and his work address, which is in the Empire State Building. So now they're going to the Empire State Building. Okay, I don't want to belabor this point any more than I already have, but like... The person writing this is aware that books normally have plots, right? Like, this isn't... This is like reading someone writing down a video game where you're doing a fetch quest. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so then he ran to Death Mountain to get, you know, the hammer of whatever from the Gorgon so that he could trade it to the blacksmith in exchange for a piece of enchanted hay, which he could bring to the milkmaid and the village of whatever's den to, you know, 
and then you know once once the cow eats the uh, enchanted haystock the milkmaid will give him a thing of enchanted milk which he can then bring to the thirsty guard in rivers brookton and then he can you know once the thirsty guard has a drink he'll open a secret portal which will take him to blah 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 like that sort of thing i'm not gonna say it's fun when you do it it's one of the reasons i don't really play video games anymore uh-huh. but like at least when you're doing it you're engaged it's this is like watching someone else do the boring parts of a video game well do you want to know what happens when they get to the empire state building and go to basil's office he's not there they don't go to his office because they get to the empire state building and emma killian and mary margaret are there like you two are in so much fucking trouble did they just leave the rest of the kids Yes! There? The whole trip! Well, I mean, there were other chaperones, but that trip was down three chaperones all day while Emma drove all over town in a taxi tracking Henry's phone via Find My Phone. Why did she bring Killian and Mary <laughs> Margaret? I don't know. I don't know. So Emma's like, okay, we're going back because this is, that's not good. You can't run away from me in the middle of New York City. It's bad. It's yeah. a bad thing to do. Yeah, it's not like he can defend himself by being omnipotent or anything. But she tells him that she'll get permission from the teachers to bring him to the store tomorrow. You mean Mary Margaret? Well, there's there's another teacher that we've never heard of before who's apparently in charge of the trip. Okay, but Mary Margaret is the one who founded the school, right? We're going off of... The 15 seconds she was interested in teaching again and created a new school for all of the kids, right? I mean, she doesn't seem to be in charge, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's like when she was mayor for 10 seconds before she got bored and gave it back to Regina. How did she ever expect to be queen? Right? She can't even handle a field trip. There are eight <laughs> extra kids. I miscounted the children. Let me tell you, when you take kids on a field trip to New York... You can't miscount the children. Okay, also, how many kids did they bring? How many? Because, like, when my school did trips to New York, I don't remember exactly how many kids we had. But, like, we only had, like, three chaperones. I mean, I feel like it was, I, I feel like it's supposed to be the whole junior class. Or, you know, the majority of the junior class. So it's probably, like, I don't know. 60 kids i guess maybe i mean i don't feel like storybrook was exactly overflowing with children at any point but also you know (laughs) i know that's why this book had to make up so many of them okay so they all go back to the hotel so they can change their clothes for the dinner cruise Mm -hmm. and henry reflects on what a rough day it's been the weight of responsibility had been heavier than he'd expected It was almost a relief to be back within the confines of normal rules, where the adults took care of everything. Oh my (laughs) god. Okay, so, as a reminder, Henry is God. Henry is God in two different ways. He's the author, a person who's literally able to rewrite reality. Literally able to rewrite reality. And he has the heart of the truest believer. Which might be a Neverland-specific thing, although we do see it work in no. other places. Yeah, we see it work in New, New York. York. Yes, which means that whenever he believes in something hard enough, it comes true. Uh, there was a point where literally everyone got trapped in a different story. He had to track down a different omnipotent being, beat the crap out of him, and then save everyone from that alternate reality. Like... Henry is by the end of the last season. Th- this is after the whole Black Fairy thing, where he yeah. fought the Black Fairy. Like, Henry is literally the most competent character in the show by the end of season six, and then season seven happens. Also, if there's anyone who doesn't rely on grown ups, it's the guy who at the age of 10 was like, oh, all of the grown ups are either trapped or lying to me. I better leave the town of my birth and go find a woman to. to Come and be the savior. I better go find my birth mother in a city I've never been to before. And does! Like, Henry's literally the worst character. Oh no, too much responsibility. Yeah. Thank goodness I'm back in the in the safe arms of adults who have never steered me wrong before. Thank God I'm under the care of 
somebody who has never tried to send me and my entire family to hell. Right? Oh. God. So they go on the dinner cruise, and Henry has a heart-to-heart with Emma about how, uh, yeah, he's he's definitely going to uh, end up breaking up with Violet. Like, this, this relationship is definitely over. Yep. And the next morning at breakfast, Emma comes to get Henry and is like, okay, I got permission to take you to that bookstore. Antique store. Antique store. By the way, it's called Back in the Day. That's the name of the store. I just realized that it's called Back in the Day. And the granddaughter's name is Whitney Day, but the woman who owns it isn't Day. The woman who owns it is Mildred Appleby. I don't know what to do with that. Maybe it's a Barney's Bolorama situation where it's named after, uh, you know, Barney Gu- Barney Gumble's uncle named it after him. Perhaps. Perhaps. Or maybe she kept her maiden name, but her husband was Day and he owned it before. Uh... Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. It could be that. Or maybe this book just wasn't thought through at all. Uh, So Emma, Henry, Violet, and Killian are all going to go to the antique shop. Mm -hmm. Which means they're going to be down two chaperones again. But whatever. Screw everyone who's not. Henry and Violet. Okay, I was going to say, does Hook really need to be here? But that's, that's true for the regular show too, so. Well, but Hook was in charge of a group of children. So now those eight children are like... Some adult has 16 kids now instead of eight or whatever. Eh, lateral move. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's it's hook. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before they go to the Empire State Building, mm-hmm. they go to Columbia University. Henry, Henry is like, hey, Emma, can we make a stop first? And they go to Columbia University because Henry's like, hey, Violet, I noticed that you seem to be, like, really into this city. Like, whatever, I don't care. I don't care for this city. But I just wanted you to see what your life could be like if you decided to come here to college. And she's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I can I can visualize a life outside of Storybrooke now, even though... <laughs> you grew up in camp. You've been in Storybrooke for, like, a year. Yeah. Ugh. Again, that's another sequence that feels like it was repurposed from another book that this writer was writing Mm -hmm. so then they get to the empire state building they go up to basil mag's office and it's rumpelstiltskin no see that would make sense no he's in a meeting i'm joking because of course that would reference something (laughs) from the show no no he's in a meeting and he'll be able to talk to them in a bit so they go up to the top of the empire state building they go to the observation deck and then they have a like oh wow this city's so beautiful moment and then henry's like oh this is bittersweet because obviously our relationship is ending but i'm not going to say anything about that now so we can have this beautiful memory anyway they finally get in to see basil and guess what he doesn't have the book anymore he does not have the book anymore It was, he was engaged by someone else to track down the book, and he sent it to them as soon as he tracked it down, so. Oh my god, is it gonna be Violet's dad? Is that where this is all leading? Oh, don't get ahead of it. Okay. (laughs) I I do like this part, though, because Violet's, like, devastated, and Basil's expression softened. I'm quite sorry, I can see this meant a lot to you. If it's any consolation, it went for quite a lot of money. (laughs) I don't! Okay. I just... Why didn't she want to write an actual plot? This is... This is bother... This is bothering me so much. Oh my god. Okay, so we are now at the part that I've been dying to tell you. I haven't even hinted at this part to you. All right. Okay. So, Henry is devastated because he's like, this isn't the way stories are supposed to go. And Emma's like, you know what? Maybe we can talk to somebody who could help you out. And she takes him to someone who is a character from Once Upon a Time. Please guess who she takes him to see. The dragon. Nope. Pinocchio. Nope. Oh, God. Um, Zelina? Isaac! Seriously. Yup! Seriously. Seriously, Isaac, seriously. I mean, I guess kudos for remembering that Isaac went to New York to get out of the show, I guess. But... Seriously, Isaac. Yep. If you if you will recall, the last time Henry saw Isaac was when he wrote the sentence, Thanks to Regina's sacrifice, Isaac's evil work had been undone. Yeah, I think 
the last serious interaction he had, not counting that, was when Isaac tied him up so that ogres would eat him. Like, like his last experience with, with this guy was him repeatedly trying to murder him after sealing his family in a cursed tomb. Really? Tome. A book. Like... Yup. Really? So we're, we're hanging out with Isaac now. Yup. And and you can tell that that the woman who wrote this book has no idea who Isaac is. Um, when Violet sees Isaac, Violet looked with interest at the man in the doorway. As the former author of the book, Isaac knew more about the history of Storybrooke and its residents than anyone. He had, after all, created much of it. No. He was <laughs> trapped in the book when Regina created it. The, uh, Regina created Storybrooke. Like. There there was no author for, I mean, I know it's complicated because time travel and time works different in different realms. But like, yeah, Isaac was sealed away before Regina created the curse. I think the writer of this book thinks that the plot of Once Upon a Time is that everything that's happening is like. Stranger than fiction style, a story that's being written by Isaac, and now, like, he has passed the baton on to Henry, but in a non aggressive way. Does Henry mention any of their shared history at all? I, I mean, he just, like, sits down and talks to him. And he's like, hey, I'm very disappointed about things not going the way I thought they were gonna go. And. Isaac's like, hey man, just remember, every ending is a new beginning, right? Thank you. Thank you for that, Isaac. Thank you for quoting the song Closing Time by Semisonic to Henry. <laughs> okay, okay. You want to hear some more of Isaac's advice? Yes. You, you want to, okay, just to refresh our audience's memories, or let them know in case they're not Once Upon a Time fans. The deal with Isaac is that a writer is supposed to be like a watcher, like from Marvel. They are supposed to witness what happens and record it. And Isaac, as a writer, kind author. of- Yes, Isaac as an author went rogue and started writing what he wanted to happen. He started changing the story, and that was an evil thing to do, and- mm. Well, I, I mean, it was evil the way he did it, but... Within the morality of the show, it wasn't a thing that authors are supposed to do, and he had to be stopped. Also, you probably shouldn't be altering reality to make better stories. Yeah. Because they are actually people's lives, and, you know, giving someone a sympathetic backstory does mean that you have killed people or what have you. So here's Isaac's advice to Henry. The best stories are those that are allowed to unfold in their own time. The stories that tell themselves through you, don't you agree? What do we do in the meantime, Henry asked. We listen, Isaac said. We listen and we try to tell the story as it's meant to be told and not the way we want it to be told. This, we, sorry. We introduce those characters who seem to appear unbidden and we say goodbye to those whose time on the page has concluded. What if we're not ready to say goodbye, Henry asked. That's irrelevant, Isaac said. They must decide when it's time to go. It's only our job to listen. Okay, if it wasn't for everything else in this book, I would assume that maybe she's hinting that character development happened off screen, and I guess he got in contact with Emma at some point and was like, hey, I'm not a giant asshole who tried to murder your entire family anymore. Yeah. But, like... That's literally the opposite of his character from the show. That's literally the express opposite. Isaac, Isaac got trapped in the book because he was breaking stories because he didn't like the way they were going. Because he thought they weren't dramatic enough. I, I, obviously, it's still on Mary, Margaret, and David. But he was the one who orchestrated Mary, Margaret, and David throwing a baby into a death pit. Yup. Like, yup. What? That, uh, see, now I'm coming at it from a different angle because that feels actively like she was familiar with the show and chose to go against it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, it seems, it's so wrong, it seems malicious. Oh, uh, okay, so after that encounter, Violet dumps Henry, but it's all, like, friendly, and they're like, oh, we've grown apart, and they agree to stay friends. And 
Henry reflects that even though he didn't get the notebook, it was good that they had an adventure. And he says, This has been the most exciting two days of my life. <laughs> what? What? Like, she knows there was a whole show where they fought <laughs> dragons and stuff, right? He was nearly torn apart by ogres in an alternate dimension. A demigod switched souls with him and then tried to murder his family to create a whole new world. Like, what? This has been the most exciting two days of my life. Even in the first season, he fell in a hole once. <laughs> like, what? Oh my god. Really? Yup. And that that's the whole book. What, so, no, no. Then Violet gets a text from her dad where he's like, Hey, guess what? Look what I tracked down and ordered from a dealer in New York. Okay. And then they go on a carriage ride through Central Park the end. Okay, but... Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So the thing about... <laughs> the thing about books is that, unlike in TV shows, you don't have to worry about, like budgets or you know how you're gonna afford special effects or how you're gonna pay for actors to do stuff so you can do like anything there's a reason that in the charmed comics they get better powers i say better in quotes because you know they're basically omnipotent by the end of the show but yeah, yeah. like you could do literally anything and you're right you could describe you shouldn't be able to describe a book in a single sentence and have it be... Two teenagers failed to buy a book. Yeah. Like, because cause you can simplify most stories. You thought book. I was exaggerating. But literally nothing happened in that book. Why? I mean, even if you're not familiar with Once Upon a Time, why wouldn't you write a book where stuff happens? <laughs> well, okay, so you brought me to a thing I'm going to want to do in the podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to rate each book twice. So right. the first rating I'm going to give it is an accuracy to the show, right? So one to five, where one is, it sounds like you read the first sentence of the Wikipedia page, and five is, it feels like I just read an episode of the show. Deep Honestly, lore. I feel like number one is Henry and Violet. I think this is going to be the benchmark for what a one is. Because it doesn't seem like the person who wrote this had... Even a, I'd say a passing familiarity with Once Upon a Time, but honestly with fairy tales. It, and it felt aggressive. It felt aggressively like she had no interest in knowing the plot of the show before she wrote the book. Yeah, I don't want to assign malice, you know, because one of the things that I hate is people going in like, oh, Tom Taylor hates Superman. That's why his run is so bad. He's trying to destroy Superman. But it does genuinely feel like this person actively was not happy with writing a once upon a time book it's strange well no so since we're not assigning malice it feels to me like she had a different young adult book that she had written and she didn't want to use up the plot on the once upon a time book she got hired to write so she just pulled out all of the emotions and also the scene where they see the statue of liberty and put that in here and that was it and then she like find and replaced all the names oh jeez so I read a couple of the Once Upon a Time comics, which were mostly super forgettable. Mm -hmm. The main one I remember is, it's pretty funny. Uh, I mean, it's not funny, but uh, it's about uh, Daniel's brother seeking revenge on Regina. He blames Regina for his brother's death. Okay. Interesting. Because then that kind of puts Regina on her heels with, like, her whole thing with Snow. I like it. Yeah. Like, it's an interesting concept, and it... All leads to, like, he, he arranges for all of the stuff to happen, for her carriage to be diverted on this different route. And, like, he traps her at the bottom of this pit that has all of these, like, anti-magic sigils. Sigils? Sigils. Sigils. Sigils around it and stuff. And he's like, aha, you can't use your magic, you know, from within the pit. And she's like, but I can use it from without the pit. And she just makes the trees kill him and then come down to get her out of the pit. And I'm like, I really like that because it... Like, it's this big, long revenge tale that just, like, ends. I like that. Yeah. And, because, you know. Also, it has Regina in it, unlike this book. Yes, also it has Regina in it. But, like, 
why would it, it? I don't want to. I don't want to assume malice on her part, but like, you know, it's a show about fairy tales. You're not putting any fairy tale stuff, and you're not having any magic in a Once Upon a Time book. You're not doing anything with any of the characters. It's yeah. It's, there's it's, there's no magic at used. There's no. Uh, yeah, there, there's nothing. There's but nothing. Even if your thing is like, oh, we're creating new fairy tales, stuff happens in fairy tales. Well, that's the thing. Even if you're creating new fairy tales, and clearly I felt like she wanted these characters to be their own kind of, like, other story, other canon. Like, have it connect to the themes of your book. I, uh... uh. Okay, so it's getting a one on the uh, adaptation scale. And then the other scale is going to be quality aside from it being a tie-in novel. And um, that's also going to be a one from me. I You didn't read it, but... Uh, I From the bits of it you read to me, it sounds like it was written by a fourth grader. Yeah, it was a... It was, it was not... You know what? I'm going to say it wasn't a good read. I will say it was a fun read. If only because it got my uh, it got my adrenaline up as I shouted, "What is happening? Why is Killian doing nothing but telling dad jokes?" You know, I, I I I spared you all of that. They have Killian telling dad. Yeah, Killian's just all he does is tell dad jokes. Why? I mean, other than I guess being Henry's stepdad, is it a magical thing that Henry Henry's truest believer powers? He's like, oh, stepdads tell dad jokes, therefore Hook must tell dad jokes. I I. I think that's what the writer thinks Hook is. There's also a part where he talks about how Killian is just this, like, carefree guy. And I'm like, mm, no, 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 no. I mean, he was drunk a lot. He's, but... he's hedonistic in some parts, but no, no. Also, upon reflection, I, I'm not sure now because, you know, how it is when you're when you're when you know a fact but you're reading a book mm -hmm. uh hang on i'm gonna have to s let me just search for something really quick in this book i'm just now realizing the book doesn't even acknowledge that mary margaret is snow white so if you didn't already know that you wouldn't know that and also it doesn't mention that killian is captain hook how does this book have a 3.91 rating on goodreads Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I looked at their, I looked at its Goodreads. I, I, a lot of the positive reviews are from people who haven't watched the TV show who are like, I guess if you like the TV show, you'll probably like this. Oh, oh, okay. I want to read the, something from this four star review, which. Okay. I can't say if this novel would stand alone without any knowledge of the show. I don't know if that's something that a Once Upon a Time novel published during the seventh season of the show needs to do. I can say that the fans of the series will enjoy spending time with these characters one last time. What? <laughs> oh, that sounds fake. Sounds fake. I wonder how many of these are uh, friends or whatever of the... Of the writer? Well, so I noticed that she does have her own fantasy series that appears to be successful. So she probably has a bunch of fans who picked up this book and were like, okay, I don't watch Once Upon a Time, so I don't know what I'm reading, but okay. I suppose the author thought if she tossed the words Camelot and Storybrooke in here enough times, it would qualify as a Once Upon a Time story. I guess the editors or whoever approved of this book thought it would too. Yep. Like... Okay, this wasn't my intention, but I'm definitely going to add looking at the Goodreads reviews, too, as a segment into this podcast. Why would you give this four stars? Although slightly boring and long at some points, this is overall a fun read. I... Uh, okay. Seeing things from Henry's perspective is a nice twist, since he is more or less on the back burner during the later seasons of the show, except for being the main character. <sighs> I... Uh... The book transported me to New York City. Oh my god. I'm sorry. I feel like reading these reviews is making me think less of the people who like the book and not... Okay, here's a good review, though. This is, the re this is a review from The Glittery Bookworm. All right. Even though I knew I wouldn't like this, I'm still extremely disappointed. <laughs> 
I think hole in <laughs> one the glittery bookworm. Hole in one. Oh. It's it's just beyond me that people are giving. I mean, I know different strokes for different folks or whatever, but like, I I I don't know why you would read this if you weren't a Once Upon a Time fan, and if you're a Once Upon a Time fan, I don't know why you would like this. Yeah. All right. So. All right. So I guess that's gonna do it. Like I said, I'm gonna try to do these once a month. All right. And. Well, if you do a Buffy one, maybe hit me up for that. That sounds like a plan. Although I read a bunch of them, so if you want the person to be unfamiliar with it, well, we would have to talk about which one. Also, there are a lot of people who like Buffy, so maybe you should get someone else. But if you need another co-host, you know where I live. That's true, I do. All right, our shows are partially listener-supported. If you want to be a supporter, you should head over to our website, www.welcometotelevision.net, and click on our Patreon link. We like to thank our current five dollar above patrons: Beryl, Patricia, Sam, Cassidy, Alex, Alicia, Ryan, Maracruz, Rosa, Javier, Benjamin, Kyle, Kate, and Jen. If you'd like to support the show in other ways, you could always rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. If you want to talk about this book with me, or any book, or if you want to suggest a book to me, uh, join our Facebook group. Welcome to Television. We can also be contacted at I Love TV Zines on Twitter or at I Love Television Zines at gmail.com. So until next month, I'm Tina. And I'm Max. And this has been the Welcome to Television Book Club.